So welcome everybody to our final panel today on the Finnerac track. Uh, my name is Ed Cable and I'm going to allow our panelists to introduce themselves real briefly. But joining us today we've got Godfrey Kutumela who's calling in from South Africa, Ademola Babalola who's also calling in from South Africa, and then Peter Kakoma who's calling in from Uganda today. So I've really got the pleasure of leading a diverse and innovative range of technologists working across all facets of the financial services and technology space in Africa. So they're going to be leading a vibrant discussion, but I just want to kick off with a little opening of, you know, what we're aiming to, to cover today. So, so Finerac, you know, is and is going to continue to play a key role in helping to, as the title notes, revolutionize financial services in Africa. And so as we all know, you know, Africa, the continent as a whole, is a fascinating market just in terms of the massive size of the market to be reached, the number of different customer segments and cultural nuances of serving customers in more than 50 different countries, the rapid pace of innovation that we're seeing with so many different technologies, many of them being leapfrogged, the massive need there is for financial inclusion and in serving those at the base of the pyramid. And with this size of the market, the massive need, all this technology happening, just the confluence of different external players, whether they be other governments, uh, platforms, technology companies, you know, looking to enter Africa. So given all that's occurring, there is a myriad of ways in which we could, you know, break down the panel and the topics we're looking to discuss. So the way we're gonna go at it is to sort of break down, you know, across the different tiers of players providing financial services in the market and looking at a number of dimensions from each of those tiers. So we're going to start at looking at more of like the financial inclusion market, so SACOs and microfinance institutions, then fintechs, then look at, you know, banks, whether they're neobanks, tier three, four banks, tier one, tier two banks, and then lastly, the platforms and the telcos. And then across all of these market segments, you know, we're going to be exploring some of those overarching goals and questions you see on the slide. So really, you know, taking a closer look at how Finerac is currently being used, what we can do, you know, at a product as well as community level to enable more innovation to better go after the rapidly growing opportunities, you know, at a product level, what are the gaps in Finerac that's hindering the community from better responding to the demand that we're seeing? And then, you know, how can we build out the developer ecosystem across Africa and enable more upstream contribution? So now that I've set the stage for what we're going to cover, let me just allow each of our panelists to introduce themselves. So Godfrey, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Ed. Uh, as Ed has indicated, my name is Godfrey Kutumela, and uh, I'm from South Africa, based in South Africa, and uh, being in the payment and banking space, you know, for the past 15 years, you know, started a career in 2007 in a bank in Saudi Arabia called Alinma Bank, wherein we insource to build a, a national bank for Saudi Arabia. And more things happens in between. And today, when I look back, uh, only about, uh, you know, 13 years ago, we're building a legacy. You know, we're building something that, you know, was not even future-proof and could not even be used beyond that. So there's a lot of experience I have in the banking sector. And uh, came in back home, I actually, you know, had the privilege of joining MTN Group wherein I overseen uh, the mobile money technology governance over 16 countries, you know, over 34 million users, you know, 150 partners across, you know, the African continents. And a lot happens in that ecosystem. And in the start, that was actually the new, you know, bank for Africans to say bank accounts will be relevant. And uh, this is a new way of doing things. A lot of experiences a lot of experimental failures and a lot of difficulties in cracking the regulatory market and all that. And uh, in the past kind of like two, two and a half years, I've met Ed, you know, through the module of engagement and we, we connected, you know, a lot of gaps in the space. And uh, today I actually, you know, cross the bridge between the community, the module loop community, and just to make sure that we can work coherently towards a, a much more successful open source based, you know, digital financial services. That That is me in a nutshell. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Godfrey. And then, Are, do you want to introduce yourself in Open Factor? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, good evening, uh, good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you might be. Uh, my name is Ade, Ade Mola Babalola. Um, 
I'm the co-founder of uh, Open Factor uh, Technology uh, Group. Open Factor is uh, it's headquartered in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm originally from Nigeria, West Africa. I have a background in uh, core banking. Uh, I started implementing core banking in 1999 uh, when Microbanker was uh, implemented for one of the banks in Nigeria. And also, I started my career as a software engineer. And over the course of two decades, I've been part of uh, over 50 core banking transformation projects across the continent and also in Europe. Uh, I think the biggest one of them was uh, for Echo Bank. Echo Bank rollout in 34 countries, where I was uh, I was a technical lead uh, for the uh, FlexCube core banking for Echo Bank. But fast forward, uh, I think about five years ago, I decided to go full time. I've been running Open Factor on a part time basis, uh, but one of the problems we identified in Africa was around uh, the cost. You know, the each cost of uh, of the big core banking uh, solution, uh, which was one of the reasons why I stepped out uh, to find uh, an African solution, uh, you know, f an African focused solution for Africans. And uh, interestingly, I got introduced to Mifos. I met Head, I think, in 2018. Uh, as an open factor, we've, uh, we've really built uh, quite a lot of solutions around uh Finerat, uh we currently engage with quite a number of big uh, financial institutions in in africa some of them are tier one banks and they're gradually warming up to you know the concept of open source core banking uh, where at this moment uh exploring some of the options uh when actively in deployment phase for one of those uh, big banks in africa i think that's about it uh from me thank you Thanks, Adi. No, we're looking forward to hearing more about your experience with all these transformations around core banking systems further in the panel. And then last but not least, Peter, we'll let you introduce yourself in Kanzu Code. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, my name is Peter Kakoma, and I lead the team at Kanzu Code, where we build custom enterprise solutions for businesses and communities around the world. And particularly with Finaract and Mifos, we have our flagship product, Kanzu Banking, which is serving uh, microfinance institutions and circles um, in the region. Uh, my background is in telecom engineering, really. I worked for MTN Uganda for about eight years where I led the value-added services section, building custom applications for over 8 million customers, and uh, gradually transitioned from that role into a role at a tech company called Andela, where I was leading a team that was building a, a platform um, for an offshore institution in the US that was building um, software for um, Heritage Bank in, in Nigeria. There was an interconnection that we're doing there before finally um, focusing on leading the team at uh, Kanzu Code, which I've been doing for it's now about seven years. Yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Okay. Well, thank you, Peter. No, I'm delighted to have such, you know, a deep and diverse range of experiences from the mobile money, the fintech, the banking, and the financial inclusion space that we can bring to bear on the, the panel today. So before we start to dive into looking at some of like the segments or tiers of the market and how Finerac's being utilized, could we, you know, open the floor to anybody to answer this first question, just to really talk about the overall size of the market across Africa and what you really see as that key opportunity across the continent. And if you want to dive in, you know, more at a regional level, feel free to do that as well as I know each of you sort of are going after different segments and regions across the continent. Yeah. yeah. Can I go for it, if you don't mind? Oh, sure. Uh, go I ahead, Ade. So the landscape in financial services industry in Africa has transformed uh, in the past five years uh, due to the, uh, to the fintech uh, incursion into what used to be predominantly the, you know, the exclusive 
uh, sector for the for the banks. I mean, if you see the likes of uh, uh, what the fintechs are doing, and also the telecom uh, with the introduction of mobile money, it has drastically uh, changed uh, the financial services uh, landscape, especially in the retail banking sector. And um, because of that, uh, most of the big financial institutions that we have privilege of working with are they're looking for new ways to innovate. Uh, but the reality is that uh, the legacy core banking system they are using, they are very expensive. I mean, for uh, I came, originally came to South Africa, moved to South Africa in 2012 for a core banking project for one of the financial institutions here, and it was a $35 million project. You know, and it's not all the banks that can, you know, that can afford to spend that huge amount of money. Not to, you know, talk about engaging the mass markets in 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 the, you know, opportunity in the in the in the in the various countries. So, so Finirax as an alternative, uh, it's cost effective, it's robust, it's tested, it's. Uh, I mean, it's one of the, it's, a, it's an offering that we're gradually engaging some of these big financial institutions with. And uh, I remember we, we, had a, we had an engagement earlier in the year, one of the top financial institutions in Africa. They did an extensive due diligence on, on Finirax and eventually they signed up a project which we're currently on now. You know, and that for me, it's uh, it's a sign of good things to come uh, in the you know in the coming years because it's uh, you know previously you're not going to have a open source conversation with a CIO of a bank, you know, for even at the HR system, not to talk about the core banking solution, but it's a conversation they are now listening to, you know, in order to help them fast track uh, their digital transformation journey. So I see a lot of traction in Africa as a continent in the coming years uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, adoption of Finirax based solution uh, for some of the tier one financial institutions on the continent. Uh, thank you, Ed. Well, thanks, Adi. No, great to hear that positive news about the, the bank you're working with and looking forward to hearing more progress. So thanks for sharing some of that data around you know, the mass markets and how some of the banks are trying to reach down. Like Godfrey or Peter, could you share more, you know, about the size of that base of the pyramid market, as well as like the, you know, the middle class segment across Africa and what you really believe is that sweet spot in terms of solution providers on top of Finteract and what parts of the African market is best optimized to go after? Okay, uh, thank you so much. I think <clears throat> building on what uh, uh, Ademola has mentioned, uh, while the space is big and very varied, we, we still, the, the main interventions in the, in the FinTech space are still primarily in the payment space. And it's one of the problems, even the previous panels have spoken about how there's been a lot of innovation in that space, but the market is much bigger than that. Um, we still have about two thirds, if not more, of the continent that's unbanked. And that's not talking about the ones that are underbanked. So we have a huge opportunity in terms of a huge market size. And then for the advances that have been made, they've been made primarily in just the, the uh, payment segment. There's a bit more that can be done in the savings, in the credit. There are also a number of advances in the credit um, aspect, but as you go higher up, there's less and less happening. So um, it's still a very wide gap. And the sweet spot that Finaract brings in is yes, it dramatically lowers the cost. So making it much, much easier to bring uh, services to the unbanked and the underbanked because you really have a, a really full-fledged platform that uh, is bringing top tier core banking uh, systems and making them available for a very small fraction of a price to a, 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 a really upstart fintech, for that fintech to be able to provide those services to someone in the remotest parts of the country um, or, or of the continent, really, so to speak. So, yeah, that, 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 that is changing the, the, the space considerably and making it cheaper and easier to go higher up in the financial services provision that can be made available to the unbanked and the underbanked on the continent. 
Thanks, yeah. Peter, and I really appreciate that. Oh, sorry, just got I was going to say, really appreciate the observation around, you know, how much innovation and growth there is in the payment space. I think we all, you know, hear of like the latest unicorns each, you know, week uh, emerging from Africa around payments, and good to know that there is still a gap in terms of providing more of those savings, loans, and other accounts uh, to these customers. And I do think, you know, Finiract and Mifos can play a key role in this embedded finance space and being able to deliver these adjacent accounts on all the innovation that's occurring in payments. And Godfrey, I'll let you you go on with what you were going to say. So. Just to, to add over what uh, Adamola and, and Peter has already you know, alluded in terms of the addressable market. And uh, the one point that uh, Adamola has mentioned was around you know, the regulatory review of this, the, the security around open source. I, I think you know, we didn't have to answer that question as Finneret. So the market has answered it already in terms of the acceptability of, you know, using open source in any industry, whether banking or payment. And that actually actually set a foundation. And Peter mentioned a lot about fintechs, you know, how the newer models, you know, around payments is all about payments now than a uh, store of value. And, and Finneret is still sitting on a very strong position to really be the center, you know, transaction and balance engine is more than a core banking now to say anything you want to build on, which requires a lot of heavy lifting around transaction and balancing, you've got a base that you actually can build on. And with the common use cases for financial systems that we've built in around, you know, KYC, you know, the, the connectors for fraud using payment hub. So now you could have a combined kind of like a open source solution that could take you both direction, could take you downstream the banking route and it could take you upstream the payment route where more and more innovation is happening today. And if you take a small market such as uh, Ghana or one city, city of Accra, there's 100 banks in, 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 in the city of Accra and about, you know, less than, you know, 15% of those have you know, repeatable core banking systems that uh, are commercials have been tested, uh, legacy, you know, a lot of challenges. So the addressable market ac across Africa is is quite huge, you know, and it's just, you know, the advocacy that we're doing before this and today just for, for people to really look this direction and, and be able to find very cost-effective and sustainable solution for kind of like uh, the poorer continent that we come from, unfortunately. Thanks, everyone. So I think we set a pretty good, you know, context, which helps lay the foundation of the market size and, you know, the various opportunities across the continent. So I'm going to start to do, you know, a little deeper dive in terms into each of those layers or segments of the market. I'm going to start with you, Peter, because I know with Kanzu Banking, you know, as you mentioned, you're focused on digitizing SACOs in microfinance institutions. Can you talk a little bit more about your solution and you know what pain points in the market it's been helping these institutions address and then you know what you know have you gotten out of Finteract that's been valuable and what more could Finteract uh, provide to you know better reach this segment of the market so okay thank you so the biggest pain pain point for these institutions is you have a huge number of people that are doing group savings but they are primarily relying on paper to keep track of these um, uh, transactions, which is a big, big, big pain. Those that have taken a few steps forward are relying on, on things like Excel, which also have their huge downsides. It's on a single computer. It's also prone to error. Uh, it also makes the, the turnaround time when you're applying for credit um, really crazy because there are multiple approvals involved. So there are issues like that. Um, and Finaract allowed us to um, have a single solution, a tried and tested solution that has been used in various uh, tier one commercial banks uh, across the world and has worked flawlessly. It allowed us to start with that base and start to build a solution that allowed um, these group savings, if, if I just call it group savings, because it's circles, it's investment clubs, it's microfinance institutions, to allow them to have a secure, efficient, cost-effective system that makes it very simple to manage their portfolio, to create different um, credit products, different savings products, different share products, and also to onboard new customers very easily. 
uh, increase their efficiency tremendously while still being very secure and still being very cost effective for them. So it helped us hit so many birds with one stone. For me personally, while I had a very strong uh, background in uh, technology, um, my, my domain uh, knowledge was primarily in the telecom space with value added services and USSD and all those wonderful technologies that are great for uh, inclusive finance. But I didn't have a background in core banking. And just knowing that I was leaning on a community that had built a solid core banking platform gave me the confidence to go out and build a solution and then now start to um, gain domain knowledge and start to build on that as we, as we interacted with the customers and started bringing subject other subject matter experts on board. But it gave us that first huge push into the space. Yeah. I'm happy to hear you know the benefit and value that the community along with the software brought. And one other question I had, you know, as we think about the SACO microfinance, you know, investment savings group space is, I know often, you know, these institutions, even if they see the value of technology, they often are constrained, you know, in the budgets to purchase or consume these services. Like what have you found have been like the most viable or successful business models to support these institutions and their needs? So we found the cloud-based works really well because a huge number of them don't have technical teams. So it's mm -hmm. really a managed service. We take that off their hands. We found that bundling our payments based on a per a, a, a pi user license, a per user annual license has also helped quite a bit because then they are paying based on how many users they have, um, which makes it a lot more cost effective for them. Um, we've also found that finding ways to subsidize the onboarding cost by um, pretty much trying to, as much as possible to automate it and involve them in the uh, in the onboarding because by and large that's actually the most expensive aspect of digitizing any one of these institutions so making it self-managed in a sense helps to lower that cost even further and then we've also found that targeting them en mass as opposed to because the customer acquisition cost is quite high if you're going from SACO to MFI to MFI if you can find a, 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 a body that encompasses a number of them, or if you can work directly with a bank like uh, uh, Mr. Ademola is doing for, for a different segment, if you can get into such spaces, it also changes the dynamic uh, considerably. Okay. No, I think we just lost Peter's video, but we still hear you, Peter, but your video has been mm -hmm. cutting in and out. But as long as we got your audio, that's good. Okay. And so this question can be for everybody, and it's sort of going to be a transition point to talking about the next segment, the the fintechs. But apart from digitizing, you know, how how do you believe like these MFIs and SACOs and more informal institutions can stay relevant and compete with all the fintechs or banks or telcos who are trying to reach down to the base of the pyramids? Yeah, just, just to jump in, in there and, you know, at, you know, in terms of the use case, I mean, you know, the, the fintech actually going ultra left to disrupt it, the, the, the payment sector. And this is really fueled by, you know, some of the global pressures to get, you know, the banking to open up their core through open banking. The initiative that is actually, you know, based on fruit globally started in the UK, you know, you know, you know, his majesty treasury department around, you know, PSD to an open banking. So if you look at the core addressable market that actually sits, you know, very close to the core banking systems are the, the SACOs and the microfinances and wherein, you know, their use cases really, you know, directly connected and, and fueling, you know, the usage of, you know, the, the the core banking services and and it's much more easier to to go in there most of these are really kind of like uh, scattered and uh, they're non-digitized and uh, what we've seen in in the market such as nigeria where in you know the only aggregator of circles can get to about 1800 users within three years so the market there for, for us to look deep into it and uh, our technology and maturity stack for that market is really surpasses any one of them, you know, being in the payment banking, core banking. So that's actually where Infinite can 
will make you know the biggest differentiator in terms of really you know fueling the adoptions of digital financial services thanks country if if i could add something <clears throat> real quick i feel the the three entities seem to seem to have a dif different strengths because uh, the telcos primarily offer the infrastructure that the last mile needs, which is primarily the USSD and things like that. While um, the fintech offers the technical know-how because the telco will rarely go into the space of setting up a core banking platform and things of that nature. The fintech is primarily offering the technical know-how that the SACO and MFI usually doesn't have. They usually don't have the technical capacity to be able to maintain a system of that of their own, even if they knew that it was open source, it's not something they can pick up and deploy and start to uh, handle, at least m primarily. Then the uh, MF, the MFI and the Circle. One of the key things about it, why it makes it very hard for these other two players I previously mentioned to do what they do best, is many of them have a social aspect to them beyond just people coming and saving money and getting it at a lower cost of, of interest um, they have a certain social aspect that bonds them together but also more than that why they are also more competitive than banks why why the underbanked and unbanked go to them more is the cost of credit is much much lower in those institutions and people are five times more likely at least in the statistics in our region of up, up to even five times or more more likely to borrow from these institutions and from borrowing from the form of financial institutions. So all of them have different strengths they play. And um, the, the, the aspect that FINARAC brings in is really the digitization aspect and the FinTech is now leveraging that to make all these other aspects work together. The FinTech, the banking, and the SACO and just making the ecosystem um, win on all levels. No thanks. I like so that. So just to continue that on that, uh, I mean, based on what we've seen, uh, the you know the dynamics in the market, I think there's a convergence, sort of, you know, just as uh, uh, Godfrey rightly mentioned earlier, uh, the addressable market, it's more on the mass market side, actually in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but if you look at the existing technology stack, actually with the with the tier one uh, financial institution, they are very expensive, you know. And in fact, we used to qualify them as uh, you know, using a Rolls Royce, where an ordinary Toyota would have been enough, you know. So the, the reality, I mean, the numbers doesn't add up. Because I remember in one of the banks here in South Africa, they tried to roll out what they call an entry entry-level banking products. I think in 2013, uh, I was privileged to be on the panel of the pro for the product design, but the number doesn't add up. You know, the the and the bulk, the 60% of the cost, the unit cost uh, for the service delivery, it's it's on the tech infrastructure, you know, and uh, and the bank had to make a, a strategic decision at that point. But with, with, the, with the product like Finerax, uh, where we started engaging uh, some of those institutions uh, just to reassure them about the capability that the system has, but most importantly, how they can separate their product offerings such that the the mass market, you know, the low value, high value products can the low value, high volume customer can be managed on the Finerac environment while they use their expensive legacy system to manage the premium of, uh, products uh, as the case may be. So those are some of the some of the uh, dynamics that we've seen in the market and I think it's going to be an interesting one in the coming years. Thank you. Yeah, and let me go back to the point Peter made in just a moment, but, but Ade, in terms of that last point, you know, have you been out of the box, been able to, you know, given the architecture of Finerac, allow you know it to sit alongside that core banking system that the bank's using for their you know high value customers and then use finerac for the lower value but higher volume uh, segment in the yeah. market so. yeah absolutely so we're currently on a project with uh I'm not gonna mention the the bank's name but they have a footprint in 34 countries in africa uh, we've been in discussion with them in the past two years 
they eventually you know uh, listen to us uh, sometimes uh, last year uh, we are we're busy running a pilot and the whole idea is that uh, uh, the retail product, actually product that falls under certain category, we sit on Finerac. And uh, so we're gonna manage the product, we're gonna manage, we're gonna have a mirror of the of the chart of accounts of Finerac. We're also gonna have all the customer, the uh, the low value customer on Finerac, but there will be consolidation at the GL uh, balance level on a daily basis. Uh, so those are the design at a very high level that we put together. Uh, the project is still ongoing. Uh, we're hoping to go live by December. Uh, God help in us, but it's uh, it's uh, it's a project that's also received a lot of attention uh, from, actually from some of the funders. I mean, there's a funder that, that, that approached us that recently invested in the bank at the set to us, listen, uh, we've been investing in uh, microfinance institutions across Africa. And the first thing we do when we put our money into this institution is to transform the technology. But we found out that the likes of Oracle FlexCube, T24, Infosys, uh, Finacool are quite expensive. Uh, but with your value offering, we think we can do a lot of work together. So that conversation is still ongoing. But the reality and the crux of the, the matter is that uh, uh we have given a commitment that we can help them save up to 50 percent of their current uh uh their cost of total cost of ownership of the core banking you know and uh and the, you know the cost of running uh the platform on an ongoing basis uh, which is uh is no brainer i mean if you walk in, in, into an all if you have a meeting with a cio and you can give such commitment uh, not just by the word of mouth, but you backed it up with action. I think uh, a lot of them will listen to you. And uh, that is a strategy we want to execute in the uh, in the coming years, uh, leveraging on uh, Apache Finerect. Okay. Well, thanks. No, looking forward to Maybe. progress on that. Oh, and Peter, did you have comments on that? Yeah, just another real quick one. Another use case is one that we are currently doing where we're also integrating with the bank. But in our case, the bank already has a core banking platform and what the Finaract, what our council banking is doing is specifically for their investment clubs and circles. So because we give them a lot more functionality. So they'll be able to go and use the Finaract back platform to have a lot more visibility on the circle mails to be able to view their balances and really interact with them more a richer system yeah no, I'm, I'm glad to hear you know that the banks are you know are able once they're lowering their costs able to reach down to these segments of the market but given what you raised peter around you know that trust and that close relationship the mfis and the socos have with the customers like what concerns do you have as the banks you know try to serve more of these customers and how you know do you think like the technology or how we as a community can help to ensure those services and products are responsibly designed and delivered to these customers? I think one of the things we need, well, it's one of the, 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 the buzzwords today is user-centered design, because one of the challenges with the customer at the very, uh, at the last mile, and it's also been one of the challenges in um, going directly, the direct, uh, to market trying to reach the very last individual is uh, a bit of an aversion to technology. Um, there's the aversion to technology. There's also um, really, there are certain cultural aspects. They have been doing things a certain way and to get them to switch and start doing things a different way, there's a lot of buy-in and canvassing that has to happen across uh, with so many different players. Um, for those that have a, a board, so to speak, which are also very few, you need to convince those. And then uh, after that, wait a while before that buying actually comes. So I think one of the things we can do as a community really is, is showcasing more, um, more success stories of things, of, of entities that have been able to successfully do this. And then also, more than that, putting in their hands tools that they can immediately see benefit from. 
because th that drives the conversation a lot faster. So if you if you, if if we if we put both the success stories and usable tools in their hands, things that they can immediately see. This is removing the 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 burden of me having to walk to a brick and mortar place to um, or um, if you're thinking of a VSLF, for example, Village Loan and Saving Association, where they walk to a certain place every week and have to put their money in a particular place. If you're giving them a tool that they can immediately see um, that this other VSLA or SACO used it and um, this is how we can use it and I don't have to walk this far, I can actually do this and immediately get an SMS showing me my balance has changed this month. So I think combining those two aspects and getting buy-in from the leaders as well would help us go a long way in uh, advancing um, uh, at the at the lower end at the last mile. Yeah. Thanks for that, Peter. No, and one of our theses is you know by providing the core banking as you know more of a commoditized infrastructure as building blocks. You know this enables like the bank, the microfinance institution, the fintech to focus more you know on the user centered design. An optimal user experience, and I want to come back to to fintechs again. But given you know we're talking about responsible design, you know, ensuring like there still is sort of a social mission focus or the consumer protections at heart. Like as you know, more foreign governments look to you know do innovation around fintech across the continent, and as more of the the platforms, you know, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, etc., you know, have a deeper presence across the continent. Like what, you know, are you starting to see there? And like, what are your concerns? Or, you know, if you do have concerns about their growing presence and what them offering financial services will mean for the, the users there? I think it's, it's both an opportunity, depending on how, how we look at it. It, it, there's a downside to it, but I'll, I'll choose to focus on, on the opportunity aspect. And I know the other uh, panelists will have something to chip in. Opportunity in the sense that, in the, I feel that in the same way there was a bit of runway we needed to hit um, with mobile money and M-Pesa for us to get a uh, certain infrastructure for FinTech to become a buzzword. Like that, that runway needed to happen for some years and that runway was being fueled by certain companies spending quite a bit in getting the last mile and uh, wider adoption. So that all the things we're talking about now, why, why payments is such a huge thing, is really it was infrastructure that we've all had to be, we've been able to build off. Of. So I think some of the things you're mentioning, the platforms, while there's a downside to them, I'll, I'll focus on the aspect of building a critical mass, really spending and building a certain momentum that is quite key on the continent because they'll be able to, there are certain uh, policies that might be, well, there might be certain downsides, but it's also possible that there are certain policies that will uh, create an enabling environment that might make it a bit easier to create um, the momentum that we need um, as an entire ecosystem across the continent to get certain um, things through the door. So. I feel they are focusing a lot on the payment space, which is great, but it also opens doors for fintechs and others to innovate and further up, but still building on the momentum in terms of um, um, people at the last mile knowing about the availability and usability of certain aspects, so that when you come to talk about your solution, you're saying this, that does that, and you're not bringing a completely new alien aspect. In the same way, we had to we built off in many ways what mobile money and MPESA did for an ecosystem across the continent. Thanks, Godfrey. Ade, did you have any more specific to add? I did want to, you know, touch on another point that Peter raised around, you know, regulations mm -hmm. and enabling environments. That was key, you know, and critical in some of the markets where mobile money got off the ground. And I know, you know, across Africa. There's a lot happening around, you know, interoperable payment systems across given countries or regions. You know, there's growing momentum around open banking. You know, there's movements to have like a, you know, single unified digital economy or digital currency. So do you want to speak to any of these regulatory trends, like whether it be 
across the continent or your your region and how you know you've been responding yeah. to them. So, so I think I'll, I'll focus more on how the regulatory requirement has affected us. Um, I think a couple of years ago, we were actually supposed to deploy Finirac in a SaaS model, which will allow MFIs across Africa to uh, to get uh, to have access to to Finirac solution in. Uh, in a SaaS model, you know, on a subscription basis, uh, but from a regulatory perspective, uh, we realized that the, uh, that there's an issue. Does this requirements around where does the data sit? I think we had we had a conversation with quite a number of uh, MFIs, especially in the SADC region and also in Nigeria. And uh, yeah, so the regulatory uh, requirement and uh, oversight function would continue to. Or play a key role in the in the market, but the good thing is that uh, from uh, from a data hosting perspective, some of the big uh, cloud service provider are um, gradually you know coming into Africa, which is going to help us uh, to to a very large extent. But beyond that, I think uh, within the area that we focus on, uh, because we don't do quite a lot in the payment space. Um, you know, from a regulatory perspective, it's only around the data uh, sovereignty and uh, where the data sits that that it's uh, that's a bit of an issue. But beyond that, we've also seen that the you know the regulators are coming up with a way to help standardize. Uh, you know the the protocols and the approach for data exchange, uh, which speaks to open banking. I know in Nigeria there have been quite a lot of work uh, that has been done uh, by the open banking community in that country. Uh, they are they are similar to I mean same with uh, Nigeria. We have South Africa is also doing quite a lot, but it's not the same story in uh, quite a number of. Uh, of countries on the continent. So I think, uh, I'm not sure to what extent uh, uh, Apache or Finirac uh, will, you know, will be of assistance in that area. But what I, what I see playing out, it's uh, what I see that we need to focus on, it's mainly on how to drive user adoption across the country. And I'm not sure to what extent uh, would the regulators assist us, uh, you know, because uh, currently, uh, you know, the regulators are operating on an individual country basis across Africa, you know, and it's quite a, it's a, it's a lot of work to do, you know, talking to, you know, uh, different regulators across, uh, you know, different geographical uh, location. Ed. Thanks, Ari. Did you have anything else to add, Godfrey, on the regulatory trends? And then one question I do want to tack on to that for everybody after Godfrey responds is just more around, you know, because I do see open source and this open source core banking infrastructure as being a catalyst and enabler of other technologies. So what are some of those ancillary technologies, whether it's digital identity, you know, distributed ledger, et cetera, that you think are going to be most transformational for the financial services market? So have that question in your back of mind while Godfrey is responding about the regulations. So. Yeah, just cl closing up on what Ademules already said as the foundation around, you know, some of the kind of like uh, all thinking around, you know, data sovereignty. And we have seen this delay in the adoptions of, you know, cloud-based banking, you know, where we are in South Africa and in some of the side countries a lot. So. You know, there's a lot of more you know, education that needs to go. And the reason why there's this kind of like a slack and slowness, you know, people that are very close to the regulators are the, the incumbent bank. And the regulators don't have the mandate for financial inclusion. The regulators has the mandate to keep the stability and security of the money systems in, in every country they operate in. And also lack of an overarching body to connect all of them really makes it difficult for anybody to you know make an impact you know across regional impact you know if you launch any 
new bank like you know maybe opay or softbank you, you find lots of difficulties in leveraging the model you implement in one country to another so we were actually typically in that situation and one other thing that the regulators will do is they don't open everything at once so they'll open a bit and see what comes out of the market and obviously the smaller providers find it much more difficult to get traction to get funding then they'll close again and say you, you ask us to open up the regulation we did open it nothing happens you know they're doing that a lot with uh, regulatory sandboxes you know they put it out there you know in south africa they've put it out there in various versions and after two to three years and said forget it there's nothing else that you need to relax we gave the entire world an open slate nothing happened so there's a lot of you know kind of like imbalances and impatiences but uh, i think if we can stick to the existing space you know we could trade with mobile money you know people could be licensed for mobile money we could license wallets so if we could leverage whatever the regulations allows today and, and execute you know execute violently you know get the technology out there may make this technology a little bit more commoditized, like you mentioned at you know to say you commoditize the core you get as many bank accounts as you like i mean if you look at the numbers in africa the, the bank people were is about 400 million across the whole of africa and uh, if you take finaret itself i mean you know finaret has empowered over kind of like 20 million users directly and about another 180 million indirectly so globally finaret has half of the entire african continent's account so it will actually be the platform to go to to take it from 400 million to 2 billion in 2025. so uh, working within the constraints we have you know bringing in the, this open source alternative that even addressed a much more lower market you know the sarcos market you know on the three segments that peter has mentioned so we've actually have that lower market to you know go through it fast track it and work on those markets the bigger uh, players like adam has mentioned those, those will actually be the hardest and the bigger players use the safest route to innovation i mean they're all applying the mm. three horizon strategy from mckenzie mckenzie says is either you do it in three ways you, you innovate from your core they, they look at that and say mm. if i innovate from my existing core my existing core is expensive and the second horizon will be build alongside your core, you know, and, and with Adamola's view of take all the non-essential and non-cost-effective accounts into the second kind of like secondary core. Then mm. the other option is to build from scratch, build a new bank. That's where they're not going to go. That's where the fintechs are knocking at them. And, and that's where the fintechs will actually help to revolutionize this, this financial market. Thanks, Godfrey. Awesome. And then yeah. real quick on that last question, you know, maybe each of you spend, because there's two other questions I want to get to in the last sort of five minutes we have. But on that last yeah. question around, you know, what do you think the most important other technology might be, whether it's digital identity, distributed ledgers, you know, artificial intelligence, cloud, you know, big data, et cetera. Like, what do you think is the most, uh, you know, disruptive I, of these other techs alongside? I, I, I think for me, um, for what we've seen, uh, it's going to be digital identity, you know, because with the, you know, with the COVID uh, uh, situation, uh, a lot of things are moving to digital now. Okay, and uh, in fact, we do have some quite a number of our, our project that we're currently executing, and uh, you know, the user uh, interaction design uh, fully digital. You know, and part of the capabilities that we are building now is to allow you know self onboarding uh, and to do that we need a uh, digital identity verification uh, authentication and stuff like that so i see a lot of uh, attraction I see a lot of traction uh, within that uh, segment in the next uh, in the coming months if not years okay mm -hmm. yeah thanks just to Peter, quickly or, add, yeah go yeah. ahead go ahead just to quickly add and wrap on my side, I think, yes, digital identity, it, it will help a lot with the, the fraud issues 
which is one of the biggest impediment for our regulators yet to open up. So if it gets improved, especially in markets where there's no common identity, it gets improved, then that will actually go a long way. And also the, the, the use of uh, kind of like, uh, you know, MI, you know, machine learning and, and AI algorithm, that will come a long way because if you look at the credit sector, you know, we, we don't have like uh, most people that has kind of like credit history in Africa. So we could leverage those uh, algorithms to try and have a dynamic way of accessing credit, not using the, the historical method that are expensive. You know, somebody has a data by himself and he will sell it. So there's more data that we could leverage using AI algorithm for things like credit scoring. And we can even, you know, expand the AI function into KYC verification function just to verify you based on who you are, not based on what somebody else knows who you are. So those are the two areas that I'll say you should look more into integrating in them and enriching mm -hmm. FINA right way. Thanks. What's your thoughts on that, Peter, that question? So. I, I feel the, the interoperability angle is really big because uh -huh. um, in many, well, it's already here and we already, I mean, even the other discussions already went through it, but just to highlight, I think it's one of those really big trends that we really need to keep leaning in on because um, in many ways, as we start to get more accounts into the ecosystem, we still want those accounts to very freely interact with the legacy systems and all those other systems that are not yet there. Um, the other one besides the digital identity would really be what uh, Godfrey mentioned. I think there's a, a huge, huge value to automating those aspects around um, our uh, um, credit scoring, because uh, that's a really, really, really big one. It's one of the big value adds. Back to you, Ed. Okay. No, thanks, Peter. And no, I'm glad to know that you know in Finteract we're trying to do I think integrations on all three of those fronts. Javier, are you giving the warning that we've got to wrap up soon? Or? Sorry for interrupting. I am enjoying a lot this conversation, really, really enjoying. But I invite you to follow this on the BOF, BOF session so we can come to the BOF session and have like continue this discussion, but in with a beer on hand. Or whatever okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, for purposes of the recording, I might have us tackle one last question you know, that we had for closing. And I'm going to combine two questions. So we didn't talk about, you know, how we can build out that developer ecosystem across Africa. So feel free to answer that one or the other question. I know, Ada, you touched on a little bit, but really is, you know, what do you see the African financial services landscape looking like by 2030 and how can Finteract help to evolve it? So real briefly, if you each want to touch on that question, then we'll have to wrap. So Yeah, so I think it's, it's already unfolding. Uh, so we, as Open Factor, we see a lot of partnership and we're leading some of the discussion. Uh, recently, we brought a tech communication company and a financial institution together. So what our value proposition is to co-create, you know, so we come to you as a telecommunication company and, you know, we let you know that, listen, if you're gonna compete or if you're gonna innovate, you need a FinTech company like us and as open factor, we leverage off, you know, open source to innovate and create value together. So in the next coming years, we see a lot of that happening because the the reality is that uh, a lot of big institution does not have the war chest to buy technology. I mean, I saw for five, 10 years ago, the tech spending in Africa used to be like 20 billion, but it has really gone down, you know, because, uh, I mean, by almost 10, 15 percent, uh, the likes of IBM, you know, they do not, they no longer sell some of their expensive technology solution like they used to, same with Oracle and everything. So you see a lot of tech companies, financial institutions, the big ones are looking at open source to innovate. So we have strategically positioned ourselves as uh, we're part of some of their uh, fintech, uh, incubation of you know for innovation so and we see that as a, as an emerging trend which obviously would carry on you know uh, into the future and uh, where we've also positioned ourselves as a as a major player 
uh, within the within the Africa space and also in Asia. We had a project with one of the financial institution in in uh, in Singapore last year. Also, we are part of their innovation hub. Uh, we innovate for them. We've actually built a completely different modules on top of uh, Apache Finerat for them. Okay, so and that is what we see as a trend, uh, you know, within that sector. Okay. So then maybe yeah, like a 10 second response from each of you because I think Javier is making us go to birds of feathers. Yeah, in, in 15 seconds, I think Ed, in terms of the ecosystem, you know, we've been working together at MIFOS. We have a very good first touch of engaging people and we, we can't keep them engaged up until they get to the end. So if we could find ways and means of shortening the journey for people to get onto Finaret, spin off some cloud, you know, options, get people to connect to a much more simpler Finaret instance that they could use instantly, get quick avail out of it. It will help us with the, the partner ecosystem. In terms of 2030, kind of like a vision, we need to try and, and get the community to grow to that level. And we also can influence from outside. So with Africans, we check first what's happening outside. So if we could grow MIFOS outside the continent, and get it kind of like you know challenging in the US, in the UK, that will actually influence our thinking here back home. I think, and Peter, like 15 Very seconds. Very real quick, you, so. developer ecosystem, I think we really need to partner with hubs across the continent because okay. we have a solid tool and engineers grow by mm -hmm. working in solid ecosystems. So partnering with them is win-win. They are giving their engineers mm -hmm. solid work to work on and we're getting a pipeline of people across the continent. So I feel that's really one direction we ought to go. I, I won't add yeah. anything to the 30 years because I think that has been added a lot, yeah. but I'll just say there might be a thing we need to do also along the lines of uh, the uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency because that also dramatically lowers costs, which is really key for yeah. our ecosystems across the continent. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Yes. We'll and continue this just discussion. Yeah. Short, mm -hmm. uh, also want to recommend that we start looking at setting up a center of excellence mm -hmm. uh, in order to drive user adoption, in actually from a, from Africa perspective. So it might be one of those things you want to put on your, uh, you know, possibly on your to-do list. Yeah, definitely okay. from the MIFOS perspective, I want to help you with that and looking forward. So please, you know, I think Javier put the link to the birds of the feather. Try to make your way in there. We can continue this discussion. But thank you, Godfrey. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Ade. You know, we're looking forward to helping to continue revolutionizing financial services in Africa together. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. Yeah, bye. Bye.